Well, the title of our sermon, and yes, we're still in the Gospel of John, and uh, we'll finish out John chapter 9 this day, the account of the man born blind, and all the events that happened after that. And the title of today's sermon is the same as last week, but you can just add part two at the end of that. In other words, the blind see, the seeing remain blind, part two, if you like. And again, it's a large portion of scripture. There's some repetition, as we mentioned last week, so um, we will read the scriptures as we come to our different headings. We'll not read the scriptures now, but please have your scriptures open. John chapter 9, and we're looking at verses 24 all the way down to 41. Uh, Verse John chapter 9, picking up at verse 24. Now, just as a reminder, after the remarkable healing of the blind, the man born blind last week, we started considering the interrogations that that resulted from this miracle, primarily from the Pharisees, as we can expect. We noted it played out like different scenes of a play, as this man was first confronted by his neighbors, scene one. And then in scene two, the neighbors take the healed man to the Pharisees to verify his identity and to verify the validity of this miracle itself. In scene three, we see the Pharisees call the parents. They are afraid to answer only to the fact that the man was indeed their son and that he was indeed born blind And that he does now indeed see. And for fear of reprisal by the Pharisees, for any alignment with Christ, uh, cautioned, uh, they took to caution and said no more than that, but to refer them back to their son for details. You may remember the text. He is of age. Ask him. And so they summon the man born blind again. In our text today, then, we see the Pharisees, and I must mention that clearly the Sanhedrin are involved here. They make a final effort to shape the testimony of the man himself. And I say the the Sanhedrin was involved, for they are the highest and were the highest ecclesiastical court in Israel and would have the power to excommunicate members from the synagogue. In fact, this scene, as well as the first three scenes we observed last week, are conducted by the Jews as a court case. Pharisees of the Sanhedrin presiding and calling witnesses to them. Well, where are we? So far, the man born blind's identity has been confirmed by the parents and by his own testimony. And as a result, his healing is now impossible to deny, even by the Pharisees. However, they do not give up. We see here that they seek to discredit our Lord Jesus Christ in his person, as well as attempt to manipulate the man by threatening him. No surprise for the Pharisees. We will refer to the man born blind from this point on as the poor man, Because he was a poor man. We told in the scriptures, we read it last week, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? So presumably he begged to keep his own living or perhaps to contribute if he was living at home toward his expenses. Well, we have two more scenes today. Two scenes with some sub-points We'll have application throughout. We'll conclude the account of the man born blind and John chapter 9 uh, with one main expanded application under main point 6. Well, picking up after scene 3 last week, we continue and we come to scene 4 and we observe in the fourth place, if you have your notes from last week, they ended at number 3, the Pharisees and the man. Enter the Pharisees and the man. Let's read together now 10 verses from 24 to 34. Follow along with me. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind 
and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner, referring to Christ. He answered, Whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never be, since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us? And they cast him out. We have two sub-points. We observe in the first place, the Pharisees seek to discredit Christ, and the poor man acknowledges Christ. The Pharisees seek to discredit Christ, and the poor man acknowledges Christ. Christ. And you can be sure, the Jews' manipulation and threatening start no sooner this poor man is brought before the Sanhedrin. The Jews and the church leaders of the time, in refusing to acknowledge Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God, in spite of multiple testimonies, and now with the clear works of God before them, they are faced with a big problem. Christ is doing good. Word of his miracles unfold every day before their eyes. And this has been going on for two years in Jerusalem, in the Judean countryside, and especially in Galilee. And we know from our study in John, that is where our Lord lived and worked with his disciples and spent most of his time. And now today, as with a year ago here, at the Pool of Bethesda, you may remember, right outside the temple gates, and now on the street close to the temple where beggars had the best spot to call for charity as worshippers made their way to the temple, Jesus performed what can only be described as also a year ago as a mighty work of God. And here's the problem for the Pharisees. Eyewitnesses abound. The man is vocal and adamant that he was, in fact, the blind man, which the neighbors assisted in confirming by taking him to the Pharisees. And now the Pharisees are running out of angles to discredit both the miracle and the man. And this might happen in a court case where a certain line of questioning by the prosecution fails. They change tactics and here the Pharisees use the authority of the church and the highest court in Jerusalem to discredit Christ as a mere man and a sinner. They had previously resorted to slander and name-calling against Christ. You recall this, even claiming that he has a demon. They even tried to prove mistaken identity of the man born blind. And now it seems they call this man back and their last chance seems to be to pressure this man by instilling fear and the threat of excommunication. Look at verse 24 of our text. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. On the pretext of giving glory to God, they declare Christ a sinner. No, they don't bring any actual charge, any public sin against Christ here in court, for they have none. 
the charge of the Sabbath day healing, they already lost that charge a year ago when Christ healed the invalid on the Sabbath day and pointed out to them and explained that the law of Moses, whom they follow, allowed for works of necessity and of mercy on the Sabbath, which was made for man. And we observed last week that word was already out. Pressure was on those who wanted to believe on Christ. And the parents we saw bowed to that pressure in fear. If anyone were to confess Jesus as the Christ, he would be put out of the temple. And yet, falsely and unchallenged, the highest ecclesiastical court declare Christ a sinner and infer that if this poor man refused to acknowledge this, in effect he was failing to give glory to God, lining him up for excommunication. Well, you notice how the man reacts. Undeterred, this poor man refuses to bow to their threats or to get drawn into the accusations as to Christ's character and person. A remarkable thing has happened to him, and Christ performed it. He cannot attest to anything else at this point except to acknowledge the truth. He was blind, and now he sees. And it is Jesus that brought about this healing and performed this good work. Look at verse 25. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind... Now I see, oh, how the grace of God is begun in him, not only in his physical healing, but greater work beyond that as he starts to see the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. As Mark chapter 28 gives us somewhat of a parable, as with nature, so is the gradual working of the Holy Spirit in the heart of the sinner. Listen to it. The earth produces by itself First the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And here before us we see, perfectly portrayed for us, this poor sinner gradually becomes a worshipper of God through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of the Spirit in his heart. Well, this answer that the poor man gives him it certainly was not the answer they were hoping for. It simply strengthened the case of this remarkable miracle performed by the Son of God. This brings us to our second sub-point. Number two, the Pharisees seek to discredit the means, and the poor man makes a rich declaration. Again, they change tactics now in something that unfolds now like a courtroom drama. The Pharisees seek to discredit the means that Christ used, namely the spitting in the mud, and the poor man makes a rich declaration. This tribunal is now clearly frustrated in the efforts to discredit the poor man and the miracle and the character of Christ. And now it seems seeking to draw attention away from the miracle, they seek to discredit the means Christ used in performing this miracle. Note their new line of questioning, verse 26, after his reply, they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And this man is unafraid. And the poor man, you notice, ignores their question completely. For to him, as he just confessed, the miracle is real, the outcome is real, it was performed by Jesus, who is real. The means he used is a detail of no real significance and importance. And he long forgot the mud and the spirit on his eyes. I was blind, but now I see. And Jesus, who at this point, the poor man knew very little about, but this he knew. He healed me of my blindness. Note his cynical reply in verse 27. He's mocking them. He answered them, I have told you, and he's had to relay the story a number of times, as we've seen, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become 
his disciples. This is a slap in the face to the Jews. They already declared that anyone who would be a disciple of Christ would be put out of the synagogue. And now the poor man taunts them with their own words. It's as if he's saying, how many times must I repeat myself? Are you doing due diligence here because you too want to become his disciples? And the truth is, this poor man was filled with joy of his newfound condition. And he does not bow to the fear and intimidation of even this highest court. And even employs his sense of humor against them. He must have been South African. When in a tight spot you make a joke. Well, their anger and their frustration is reaching boiling point. And then they turn and they revile him. And they do to him what they've been threatening everybody with, including the man's parents. They excommunicate him. Something the blind man does not fear. He's not been able to be a proper worshiper all his life. And it doesn't worry him because he has found a newfound faith. As we see in his rich declaration. Let's read verses 28 to 34 and you'll see what I mean. And they reviled him saying, you are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. As if to say, you guys are, you guys are the most important here and you don't even know what's going on here. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. What could they say? They are crazy with rage. You were born in utter sin. That's all they can say. And you would teach us. We are Pharisees. Some of us went to the school of Gamaliel. You would teach us. And they cast him out. And it seems from the parable in Mark 4, first the blade, and now we seem to have then the ear. As the spirit works in his heart, as his faith starts to form. He has a rich declaration from a poor man. From being poor only in earthly terms, he's becoming poor in spirit, which will make him rich in God and in Christ how this uneducated, blind for all of his life, poor man exhibits faith and understanding beyond that of the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sanhedrin with all of their fine learning and education. Those that were blind see what the seeing failed to see, who remain blind, dead in their trespasses and sins, but our poor, previously blind man, by the grace of Christ and the work of the Spirit of God, sees in this miracle the works of God displayed through Jesus. And hence his rich confession. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Though his understanding was not yet complete, this much he clearly understands. No one can possibly perform a miracle of this magnitude, one that has never been performed since the world began and up to this time had been unheard of even by the greatest prophet Moses. And he in simple faith concludes, Jesus, at the very least, and soon he will know more, is from God. The poor man's final answer that the Jews once more causes them to lash out at him in anger, condemn him as a sinner, and put him out of the church. Verse 34, they answered him, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. Exit the poor man, now excommunicated, exit the Pharisees. 
Scene five, the grand finale we observe in the fifth place, Jesus and the poor man. Jesus and the poor man. Read with me verses 35 to 41. Jesus heard, he wasn't present, that they had cast him out, and having found him, said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, Who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him. It is he who has, is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. The Pharisees are hanging around, and perhaps their spies were following the man. Where will he go next? Some of the Pharisees heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now you say we see, your guilt remains. And as we come to our final scene, we do not see anyone being summoned. We see rather the gracious, gentle Savior about his most important work here on earth, to seek and to save that which was lost. Like the gradual growth of corn, so spiritually we observe in this man by the powerful word of Christ and the work of the Spirit, the full grain in the ear. The earth produces itself first the blade, the blade then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. We have four sub-points we observe in the first place. Number one, Jesus seeks out the poor man and reveals himself to him. Jesus seeks out the poor man and reveals himself to him. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ beautifully displayed here. Jesus heard that they had cast him up and he looked for him and having found him. Christ does not summon him. He does not send his disciples or someone else to find him, but Jesus himself seeks him out. And it is often when men are at their lowest that Christ seeks them out. It is often when men are discouraged. It's often when men are brought low in for whatever reason, through death or financial ruin, that people are tender to the word of Christ and the gospel, and Christ seeks them out. As the Spirit of God brings the sense of sin and unworthiness upon a sinner, so God draws him to the Savior, and the means God uses is the word of Christ. It is always a word that brings faith to the heart that a man might believe. Faith still comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. We see Christ's questions to the man. Verse 35 to 37. Jesus heard they'd cast him out. Having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I might believe him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him. It is he who is speaking to you. And here we have a rather rare Remarkable occurrence in the words of Christ. In this gospel, in fact, the whole of the New Testament, the teaching is clear as to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, in this gospel of John, only four times, we find Christ expressly declaring his divine sonship. Go back to 5 and verse 25. I'll read it to you. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming... And is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Here in our passage in verse 37, Jesus said to him, 
You have seen him, and it is him, who, he who is speaking to you. John 10 and verse 36, Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the Son of God. And the last one is John 11 and verse 4. And this is at the death, the news of the death of Nicodemus. When Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. And brothers and sisters and friends, this should be no surprise to us, because this is the theme of the whole Gospel of John. And that verse that you should really memorize, as I said before, John 20 and 31, but these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Here we see John's purpose in writing being achieved in this account. And because of Jesus' words, faith comes to this man. Faith comes to this man. So we observe in the second place, the poor man confesses Christ and worships him. The poor man confesses Christ and worships him. That short verse in verse 38, he simply says, he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is how every child, every child of God comes to faith in Christ, often by the gradual, sometimes sudden work of the Holy Spirit in the heart. But it is always through the word of Christ for there is no other name given under heaven by which men may be saved. And we know that Christ deals with every person differently. Some are brought, brought gradually into his kingdom. We have saints of 30 years who may not be able to tell you when it is they came to Christ. Some dramatically like Saul of Tarsus and the bright light from heaven are saved, it seems, at one stroke. And friends, if you've tuned in and you're listening today, for 2,000 years, since Christ was on this earth, the Father still draws sinners to Christ. The Holy Spirit still convicts the heart of a man concerning righteousness and judgment. Nothing has changed. And when this has happened in your heart, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear, then you, like this bland man, confess and you believe. And this is the free offer of the gospel 2,000 years later. Thirst, come, drink, and live. Thirst, come, drink, and live. Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And here we have a man born blind, the humble, poor, and the blind believe. We observe in the third place, the third place, Christ's judgment in this world gives sight to the blind and leaves the seeing blind. Christ's judgment in this world gives sight to the blind and leaves the seeing blind. Now we've noted a few times in our study of this gospel that Christ did not come into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He came as Messiah, as Savior, to seek and to save that which was lost. But to be sure, on that last great day of the Lord, Christ will, at his second coming, indeed judge both the living and the dead. And the scriptures are clear, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. However, we see that the light of the world, when on this earth, exposes darkness 
even as he brings some into his marvelous light, out of that darkness, so as we see here, there is a sense of judgment in Christ's first coming, as our passage explains. Look at verse 39. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. What Jesus did here first physically in this man, made the blind see, is what he does spiritually in the heart of those for whom he died. Made the spiritually blind see. And his judgment is seen in this, that those who refuse who be- to believe on him, even though they see, remain blind spiritually devoid of light and condemned already, as was the case with many of these Pharisees on that day. The wise, the powerful, the noble, the rich of this world, many remain in that state, blind though they think they see. The poor and the wretched, the blind and the humble, who see themselves as such, dead in their trespasses and sins, to those who come to him, to them Christ grants an eye to see, and he opens their eyes. This is illustrated for us in the fourth and final place, as our last scene closes with a terrible warning for unbelief. We observe in the fourth place, like the Pharisees, refusal to believe in Christ results in condemnation for your sin. Like the Pharisees, refusal to believe in Christ results in condemnation for your sin. Verse 40 and 41 of our text, read it with me. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. It is only the blind that can be made to see. If you believe that you are spiritually blind, dead in your trespasses and sin, deserving the full and just punishment for your sin, Christ can give you sight. But if you believe, like the Pharisees, that you can see, that you are in and of yourself righteous and enlightened by your own wisdom and good works, you see yourself as fit for the kingdom of God. I am so much better than others. I am religious to a point. No matter what theological theological degrees you possess or what schools you've been taught in, you remain blind. You remain in your sin And you will die in your sin, as Jesus warned, if you do not come. This is the message of the gospel to the whole world. This is the message. This is the message given in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Believer, rejoice that though you were once blind, now you see, now you see, like the blind man, I may not have all the answers. I certainly don't understand eschatology, which we started studying this morning with Pastor Sam. I'm so glad for that. But this I know. I was blind. But now I see an unbeliever. Unbeliever, I I plead with you today. See your sin. Understand your blindness, your spiritual death. And see the Savior in the Scriptures. See Christ there as taught in the Scriptures, dying on a cross, giving his life as a ransom for many, and believe on him. That is your only hope today, tomorrow. This week may be your last chance for this life 
and the next. Delay no longer. These things are true. This is the word of Christ, the Son of God. Believe and live or remain in your sin and die. We come in the last place, main point six, and this is very brief. Main point six, we've had applications throughout, and that's the way I just do things, I guess. But here we have a final one lesson and an expanded application. The main lesson, I believe, for this passage, number the one point, number one, if you like, but there's no number two, it does not take great understanding or learning to come to Christ. Even a child can come. It does not take great understanding or learning to come to Christ. Even a child can come. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 reminds us, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where, who is the wise one? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand a sign, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who have been called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than man. The blind man's words. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Brothers and sisters, these are words which every born again person can apply to himself. There may be many things of which you as a young believer has little knowledge, many points of theology or prophecy you may not understand. But the believer knows this one thing, that the eyes of his understanding have been opened. He was blind, but now he sees. He sees himself as a lost sinner. He sees the danger before a holy God. He has seen the divinely appointed refuge from the wrath to come. He has seen the sufficiency of Christ to save him. And the saints of God may be weak and lacking in understanding, but they know that they've been brought from death to life. They've been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his son. They know in whom they have believed. They know that their redeemer, their savior, who died, rose again, and he lives. They know that they have passed from death to life. And they know that all things work together for good to those who love God, and be called according to to his purpose, and they know that when the Lord shall appear for the final time, they shall be like him, and they will be with him forever. Christianity treats certainties and realities, not theories or hypotheses, reasoning based on limited evidence. Do not rest, do not rest. Plead with you today until, like the blind man, you can say, One thing is certain I was blind, but now I see. And I would urge you again, young people, even children, does not take great understanding and learning to join a church. A child can join. Don't be overwhelmed by our confession of faith. Oh, I'm going to be asked questions, I'm not going to know. Do you know that Christ died for your sin and you believe on him? Do you believe that he is Lord? Do you believe that he rose from the dead and he, after dying for your sins on the cross? That is enough. Then come to him. Be baptized. Believe in him and join the church of God. It does not take great understanding or learning to confess that Christ is God. Only faith. And guess what? 
That's a gift of God. It does not take great understanding or learning to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. And you look at some people in the church, they've been believing so long. I want to believe. I believe in Christ. But you know what? I'm not going to make the cut. I can never be like this pastor or like that member. I can never be. Brothers and sisters, it does not take great understanding to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. It takes simple obedience to the words and the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. Perhaps you've heard the gospel many times and you believe it with all your heart, but you're afraid to come. You feel unworthy, insufficient, undeserving. We are all these things. All of us who are believers were these things, as was the blind man, as is everyone who comes to Christ. Christ did not come to call the righteous, but the unrighteous to repentance. Believe on him. He will open your eyes and he will heal your blindness. Those whose eyes have been opened, drawn to God, drawn by God to Christ, by the powerful working of the Spirit, there remains nothing else for you to do. Believe on him. Believe on him. Then you start to learn. Then you can become a lifelong disciple. Do not wait until you feel worthy. Then you will never come. Come to Christ today. I finish with this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, how we bless you for the words of Scripture. How we thank you for this gospel that teaches us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That teaches us that we are blind and we desperately need to see that we are dead in our trespasses and sins and we desperately need new life. And it teaches us of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor. Oh Lord, encourage the hearts of all your people today. Encourage us to live for you Encourage us to be obedient disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Encourage us to grow by your spirit in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ through the very words of Christ that are here. And Lord, we pray that those who have not come, those who feel unworthy, those who believe but feel they cannot, Lord, draw them by your spirit to come and to believe even this day, and we pray these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen.